Every town has its stories, its secrets. What possible harm could come from sharing them? Hmm? This is small town horror. Small Town Horror is a weekly podcast presented without commercials, which means it's up to you to keep the search going with your donations. I've only been able to keep doing this as long as I have thanks to the support of the listeners as I search for answers. Please visit patreon.com slash smalltownhorror to ensure those answers are found. I thought because it was a different hospital it would feel different. I thought that because I was in street clothes instead of hospital-issued pajamas that I'd feel separated. I thought I'd feel like a different person. I didn't. It's not like I was committed there because I went crazy. I got drugged and dropped off in the middle of the woods. They just didn't know what else to do with me and I was so messed up from essentially living in a hole. Can anyone really blame them for wanting to put me somewhere safe? Regardless of whose safety they were more concerned about. Honestly, I felt fine about it all up until the moment Julian and I walked into the facility and lest we forget my, as Julie would have put it, ragingly stupid idea of thinking I should get myself committed to. Oh God, I can't even say it out loud again. Look, I'm not smart, okay, but seriously, what the fuck was that? It's all just so different when you're in the middle of it. Just making plans is complicated. The idea that the whispering man is behind us somewhere doesn't make it better. And for all that I do to try and mislead and redirect him, assuming he's following us at all, There's the constant paranoia that he's right there. I suppose that was his final gift to me. I don't know if I can ever feel like there isn't someone standing there in the darkness. Watching me break down. Maybe I just traded him for you, St. Clair. Anyway. We walked to the receptionist's desk and she asked us to wait while she called Tom's primary physician. About ten minutes later or so, a man in a white coat walked down the hall. He was a bit shorter than me, stocky build, glasses rested on his forehead, and he made no bones about who he was. The moment he came into sight down the hall, his eyes never left mine. Ryan Jennings? Yes, and you are... Dr. Hemming. I've been working with Tom for the last year. I spoke with his sister about your visitation. And... Would you mind stepping into my office? I didn't have to try too hard to imagine the kinds of things he wanted to talk to me about, and I asked if Julie wouldn't mind waiting for us. As I should have expected, she minded a lot. No, I don't want to just sit around this place. It won't take long. Then there's no reason I can't go in there. What else am I supposed to do? Just take a drive? Go get something to eat? That's not exactly an option anymore, is it? Fair enough. Just let me answer the questions. Don't get defensive. Why would I get defensive? For the way he's about to talk to me. His job is to talk to people who have mental... incapacities. All day. And I'm here to talk to one of his patients. You won't even know I'm there. I don't think that's possible. Aw, you picked the strangest times to sound sweet. We sat down in Dr. Hemming's office. He had his back to the window and the glare from the sun made it a little difficult to look directly at him. Couldn't help but wonder if he did that for a reason. Okay. Why exactly do you want to talk with Tom? I think he knows something that could help me. And you think that was the sort of answer that I would be okay with? I have no idea what you're okay with. That's just the answer. 
care to be more precise? I think that Tom and I went through something similar. And I think you might remember what happened to him. Exactly what happened to you? It's strange how often I'm torn between wishing people listen to my podcast and wishing no one ever listened in the first place. I laid out the abridged version. There was no sense in lying. He could have found plenty out about me with a simple Google search anyway, and he had it well within his authority to not allow me to speak with Tom. I don't think that I'm going to permit you to speak with Tom. Why? Mr. Jennings, I have no obligation to go over Tom's specific diagnosis with you. But suffice to say, I don't think that you bringing your own perceived notions into a conversation with him, not to mention what clearly appears to be a significant level of your own trauma, is something I can support. Speaking with him could have detrimental effects on his treatments. So you've been able to treat him. There have been improvements in his condition. Doctor? These things take time. So, no. That wasn't an insult, Doctor. I'm really asking. This means everything to me. I need to know if there's curing whatever happened to Tom and whoever else. Tom's condition is complicated. There are times when he is completely lucid and conversational. He is polite and kind to staff and other patients. And at other times... What? He's not. When he's lucid, does he ever talk about what happened? No. In fact, broaching the subject with him triggers a drastic personality change. Is he violent? I don't feel comfortable talking about this with you. After I got taken, the second time, they found me in the woods. They had to sedate me. I was terrified of darkness and other things. What was your course of treatment? I don't know. Time, I guess. Time doesn't seem to make a difference with Tom. I think there's something else that went on with him. And that's what you want to ask him about? Yeah. Let's say I did allow you to talk with him. I can almost guarantee that your questioning will provoke a negative mood change. I'd still like to try. Do you truly believe you can help? I don't know. Have you ever treated soldiers? Yes. Did you serve? No. Did you ever try to tell them that you understood what happened to them? How'd that go? This isn't a war, Mr. Jennings. I beg to differ. Different battlefield, but still. I insist on being present along with a member of my staff in case the situation devolves. And I need to record it. <clears throat> yes, I was made aware of the request and was made aware that you are most likely recording now. State law only requires... Yes, I'm aware. But still, you walk a fine line. Every day. Tom was in therapy at the time, but the doctor said we could come back in about an hour. I got a 30-minute window with him. That was all. A lifetime worth of questions that I suddenly felt compelled to direct at a man I'd never met. And who more than likely had been a victim like me. What was I supposed to say? What would you have said? I wasn't prepared for that room. I'd expected someone different. The man who stood before me looked completely healthy and lucid. He smiled politely as he sat down. Hi. <laughs> um, hi. I'm Ryan. Yeah, uh, the doc told me. 
He said, you know my sister? Yeah, we met earlier this year. Resident Minnesotan? How could you tell? <laughs> Wild guess. So what brings you here? I was completely thrown off. It felt more like meeting a door-to-door salesman than talking with a patient in a mental health facility. So I took a chance. I wanted to ask you something. Okay. Do you hear it? Just about every muscle in my body clenched at that point. That room felt ice cold as I braced for Tom to jump out of the chair and attack me or go the complete other way and just shut down completely. He didn't do either. Yeah. Yeah. You do too? Yeah. Okay. You know they don't understand, right? I know. But you understand. Yeah. Except you're out there. And I'm in here. Why is that? I can't figure that part out. When did it happen to you? I was 18. Huh. Well, I was more than a bit younger than when it happened to me. You think maybe that mattered? I think about it a lot. It makes me mad sometimes. At the times it makes me sad. Other times, I guess I don't feel much at all. I don't remember how I got there, but I'm guessing you weren't going to ask that, were you? If you hear it too, you don't remember it any better than me. But you remember what it was like, right? And feeling of being so confused and then mad and then scared. <laughs> I remember my body shaking so hard that it hurt. As cold as I thought that it felt, you'd think that I'd lost all my fingers to frostbite. That's how my chest shook. I still shake sometimes when I think about it. Doesn't happen much during the day, mostly at night. Sometimes things will trigger it. You know the sorts of things, right? What kind of world is that? world where you can't hear people laughing, where you don't want to make people laugh. That used to be one of my favorite things to do, make Anna laugh. Felt like a failure when I moved in with her, you know, her big brother couldn't keep his life together and all that. But I could still make her laugh. But that's gone now. Can you laugh? Yes. I couldn't for a while, though. Well, what was your secret? I broke. Aren't we already broken? Yeah. So there's further down from where I am? I don't know where you are. You kept looking for something. I ran away. You think it bothers them? You, you talking to me like this? I mean, it's no offense. Doc, really, it, it's just, I mean, look at him. Can't you see it? Sort of feel sorry for him, don't you? No offense. Uh, sorry, it's uh, Ryan, right? I just mean, well, you have that look. I know that look. 
There are days when I'm in here and the sun's on my face and I listen to the world outside and I think, I'm fine. I'm here. I'm going to be okay. And then I'm not. And things get bad again. I bet you get real mopey sometimes though, right? And I bet they got a diagnosis for that here. Maybe I'm just here because Anna got too worried about me. I mean, no offense, but uh, maybe no one cares about you enough to put you here. Maybe. What were you looking for, Tom? Yeah. Everyone wants there to be an answer. They want a name for it so it can be real. You know why that is? Because if it's real, then it's something they can avoid. And if you got this evil place, people walk around it. And if you got this evil person, people run away from them. But when you got this bad thing that doesn't have a name and doesn't have a place, then it's just out there to be found. Those times when Anna found me, I don't, I don't know where I was going. I was, I was looking for a place that felt, I don't know, I suppose the word is hopeless. I was looking for something that didn't have a future, a place where everything you have and everything you could have had is gone. And you thought that was a Taconite Harbor. Is that where I went? That's what Anna said. Anna. It takes that from you, too. Takes what? Everything. Everyone. That's what the laughter is. It's everything in your life going away until all you have is the silence. See, but that silence didn't get filled with tears. It gets filled with the insanity of everything we do. That silence and darkness, it makes a person lose everything. It makes you feel so small and alone that all you do and all you can do is fall into it. I think more people know it than we let on. People don't like silence anymore. They listen to music and they use their phones. They feel that silence because they got a feeling what's waiting in it. What's the first thing you remember after it happened? I was at home with Anna. She started asking me where I was. Then the police started asking. More people asked though the further away I felt. I'd gone so far away. Like that quote about looking into the abyss. Once it got inside of me, I couldn't get it out. And I needed to find it again. Hearing someone laughing, it was like a mockery. You know, that laughter was inside of me. But laugh tracks were chuckle. It was it was like they were laughing at me, at what I lost. I had to leave. It was torment. Constant, like the world was in on it. And I just needed to find that place again. I needed to go back to the place I understood. That empty place. Everything lost its meaning. And then I came here. Do you know where it happened to you? What do you mean? I need to find where this happened to you. Maybe it's where it happened to me too. I... You mean you don't know? No. How could you not know? I can't remember anything immediately before or after. No, no. Mom, it's okay. Why don't you sit back down? 
No, 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 no. How can you not know? Do you know where it was, Tom? Tom, I need you to try and calm down. Calm down? He, he doesn't know where it is. How, how can you not know? No! Nurse, how can you not know? No! Tell me! Ryan, how can you not know? That sound was Tom launching himself at me from across the room and wrestling me to the ground. Dr. Hemming and his orderlies were on me immediately. He continued to scream at me nonsensically as they dragged him away down the hall. Before Julie and I could leave, Dr. Hemming came racing down the hall after us. Jennings? Mr. Jennings, what the hell was that? What? I'll be in touch with Tom's sister. If there is any regression in his therapy, I will fully back whatever legal recourse she wants to move forward with. I don't know what you think you were doing, provoking. Provoking? Are you fucking kidding me? You were there? I was just asking him questions. Did he say something to you? When? When you two were on the ground. It looked like he was saying something. He didn't say anything to me. Can I tell you a secret, St. Clair? Yeah. He told me something. But one thing at a time. See, the whispering man must have got frustrated following us around. Because he upped his game. He did the one thing that could possibly get me to act. And he posted it for the world to hear. What would you have done, St. Clair? Till next week. Small Town Horror is a weekly podcast presented without commercials, which means it's up to you to keep the search going with your donations. I've only been able to keep doing this as long as I have thanks to the support of the listeners as I search for answers. Please visit patreon.com slash smalltownhorror to ensure those answers are found.